afternoon, everybody. My name is George O'Farrell. I'm chairing the session this afternoon, which is entitled Food or Fuel, Can You Have Your Cake and Eat It Too? Um, I haven't got anything useful to say to you, so I'm simply going to introduce uh, Drew Hutton in the, in the middle, who has been an environmental campaigner in Queensland for the past three decades and a social movement activist for considerably longer. He founded the Queensland Greens in 1991 and was co-founder of the Australian Greens in 92. He was the Greens' main spokesman from 91 to 2007 but resigned uh, all his positions in early 2010, not in a fit of peak, but to campaign with farmers and rural landowners about coal seam gas and coal. Drew's currently a member of the Six Degrees campaign and a spokesperson for the Friends of the Earth in Brisbane. He's also an, the author with Libby Connors of A History of the Australian Environment Movement, published by Cambridge University Press in 1999. Drew, although I introduced him first, we'll speak to you second. First um, is Rob McCreith, who is a grain and beef farmer from Felton on the Darling Downs. Uh, he and his wife and three children emigrated to Australia 16 years ago after selling their dairy farm in Scotland. I was going to make a joke at this point about Scottish cows, um, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> Rob is president of the community group Friends of Felton, which is fighting to defend the Darling Downs from coal mining. He's an advocate of renewable energy and is puzzled by the reluctance of politicians to adopt what seems such an obvious solution to the threat posed by climate change. Um, I'm advised that Rob is alone in that puzzlement, but without further ado, let me introduce Rob, Mc Rob McCreef. Yeah, thanks George and thanks everyone. I'm sure there aren't any funny jokes about Scottish cows. Um, ex um, please excuse these uh, slides if they're a bit rough and ready. I'm still um, trying to uh, learn the mysteries of these things. Um, there's a crisis at hand. You might not realize it sitting here in, in Brisbane, but um, just on the other side of the, of the dividing range on the Darling Downs, our food supplies are under threat, our water supplies, the air we breathe. It's, um, it sounds like alarmist talk, but it's the truth. Uh, just a little bit of background on um, food security. Now, if I'd done this slide properly, I would have had all these little words coming up one by one so you could read them in turn, but I'll just um, blast through them. Um, we know the population of the world is rising fast. The population of Australia is rising fast too. Land availability is declining around the world due to urbanization. We've got cities moving into uh, farming land. And even in Australia, we've got that in cities like Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Housing is being built on land that used to grow vegetables. We've got mining destroying land. And we've got degradation of land through poor farming practices, erosion and that sort of thing. Uh, water supplies are decreasing. Irrigation aquifers are getting pumped dry. All around the world, you look at uh, a country like Saudi Arabia that used to grow 3 million tons a year of wheat, uh, irrigated from um, underground aquifers. The aquifers are nearly finished now, and Saudi Arabia is now importing wheat again. Same story applies in India, China, and other places. We've got climate change already upon us, making it more difficult to grow food on the land we've got. Uh, we've got problems with peak oil, peak fertilizer, and peak everything else. So um, we've got major challenges. Uh, you might think Australia's got no worries when it comes to food security. Um, and if you looked at our overall agricultural exports, um, you, you would think there's nothing to worry about. But if you take away the bulk commodities like wheat and beef and cotton and wool and have a look at fruit and vegetables, um, we do have some problems. If you look on this slide here, the, just look at the... Um, the imports figure and compare it with the exports. Uh, this is uh, information from GROWCOM, the peak body for Queensland horticulture, uh, recently released on their website. You can see that we import more fruit and vegetables than we export already. And that's it in, in graph form. The blue bars are our exports. The green bars are imports. It's a little bit hard to see. The one on the left is fresh and chilled vegetables. The middle one is fresh and chilled fruit and nuts and the one on the right is processed fruit and vegetables. So already, in dollar terms, we import more fruit and vegetables than we export. 
little bit about climate change. It's a graph of uh, CO2 levels from ice cores going back 800,000 years from the IPCC. Uh, strong correlation with temperature. The uh, Earth is warming. 97 out of 100 climate experts think we've got a problem. That's good enough for me. We better do something. Now here's a slide of uh, coal reserves in southern Queensland. And if I could use this point to take a break. You can see we've got a, a strip of coal that runs from roughly south of Brisbane up through to Woomba and on out through what is now known as the Surat Basin. We've got a lot of coal in Queensland. The Premier says we've got enough to last 300 years. Here's a map of the Darling Downs, roughly the Darling Downs. Um, up in the top um, left-hand corner is Dalby. Toowoomba's in the middle right and Warwick's sort of bottom right. So roughly the whole region is covered in one coal permit or another. The green, the green uh, areas are exploration permits. The blue areas are called mineral development licenses. That's one step on from an exploration permit. And the brown areas are, are actual mines. So the, uh, the Ackland mine is there. Oh, whoops. Press the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> I was looking for the pointer. Aha. Uh -huh. Up here is... Um, yeah, Toowoomba's in here. Uh, that's the Ackland mine, it's an existing mine. This is uh, Milmeron, and that's uh, Cogan Creek up near Chinchilla. So those are, those are coal permits. And then if you put the gas permits on top, uh, those are the checkered permits and the pink ones. You can see the whole area is covered in both. And I haven't got uh, mineral permits like bauxite on top of that, but they, they go on top of that as well. So if you're a farmer in the Darling Downs, the chances are you've got a coal permit and a gas permit and often also a bauxite permit over your place. Now the natives are getting a bit restless. Um, this is a meeting at uh, Gowrie Junction on the outskirts of Toowoomba, February this year. A public meeting was called after an exploration permit was granted over the region. 700 odd people turned up. Because we know what mining does. This is the Ackland mine, this is a blast from the Ackland mine, filmed from the um, photo was taken from the kitchen window of a neighboring farm. How do you fancy living next to that? So the, the Ackland mine is quite close to Toowoomba and it's an example of, of what a mine is, uh, total environmental destruction. There's a town there of, uh, that used to have 400 people and um, virtually the entire town has been bought by the mining company and there's one guy left, and this is him, and he's Glenn Butel, and he's an amazing guy. And he's also got quite a sense of humor because he put this, um, he put this poster up on the, uh, the coming events notice board. <laughs> he, um, he's a pho photographer, and he looks after the local koala population. Now, it seems crazy that um, if we've got enough coal to last 300 years, why on earth are we digging up towns? Now, this is interesting. Uh, it's a little bit technical, but um, we, we all know that um, the government always talks about royalties and how important um, royalties are to the economy and how we need royalties to pay for schools and hospitals and everything else. Well, if you have a look at the, the legislation that controls mining, um, a fair bit of land on the, on the eastern Darling Downs is um, affected by private coal royalties because the, the legislation specifically mentions land that was granted freehold before 1910. So um, this question was asked by um, Dorothy Pratt, who's the independent member for Nanango in the Queensland Parliament, and her electorate covers Ackland. So she asked the minister at the time, who was Stephen Robertson, this is February 2010, how much income in coal royalties has the Queensland government missed out on in the past 10 years due to private coal royalties? And it was pretty interesting because he, he, he gave a pretty clear answer. And this is the first time I've ever seen it written down that the government actually admits that this exists. So in the, the 10 years ending December 2009, he said royalties collected by the state amounted to 11.4 billion. And he talks about funding schools and hospitals as they always do. And then just cast your mind down the bottom. For the 10 years, the same 10 year period, 
Royalties on coal accruing to parties other than the Crown amounted to approximately 554.1 million. Now, the information that we've got is that um, all, the vast majority of that money, if not all of it, has been paid to mining companies who have bought land with their royalty rights attached. So if you happen to buy a block of land that comes into this uh, category, then if you dig up coal, you don't have to pay royalties to the government. So our information is that the government is getting next to no royalties from that Ackland mine. And um, all the destruction that's being caused there is making the mining company a lot of money, but it's not giving much back to the people. And the people of Toowoomba that complain about all the trucks that run back and forth through Toowoomba carrying coal down the range and all the trains that spew dust, uh, they're, they're pretty angry to know that the government's not getting much in return. And likewise for Felton, where we are, if a mine was allowed there, the government wouldn't make any royalties. So why on earth would it be allowed? This is a, um, an original title from the Felton Valley. And you can see it's got beautiful um, handwriting. And this title's uh, made out to James Tyson, who was um, Australia's first millionaire. He was a baron of the bush, member of the Queensland Parliament. And you maybe can't see it, but um, this is dated 1876. So the key date is March 1910. So titles before March 1910, there's a fair chance that royalties are due not to the crown, but to the landholder. So this clearly shows that land on the Eastern Down was on the Eastern Downs was settled long before that. So it's an obvious question. If the government's getting no royalties, why would you allow it to be mined? This is a lettuce um, paddock in the Felton Valley, 35 hectares, and it grows 4 million lettuces every year. Sorry. <laughs> sound effects. I didn't realize I had the soundtrack to this. Um, <laughs> where... Uh, this is um, the aerial view of, of Singleton in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales. Uh, you can see the open cut mines, you can't see the underground mines. But this just shows what effect mining has on the landscape if it's allowed to proceed unhindered. And the Hunter Valley has had a much longer history of mining than the Darling Downs has. So you've seen the slide before with all the, the coal permits for the Darling Downs. Uh, this is the future that awaits the Darling Downs if nothing is done. So in um, the local paper, the Newcastle Herald, it's always full of, of newspaper stories about dust and health issues. This is a local GP, Dr. Rao. You might have seen him on ABC Four Corners. He's doing his own trials on kids because he's noticed how many kids with asthma there are in his town. And when they go on holiday to the beach in the summer, the asthma clears up. When they come back to town, the asthma comes back again. So New South Wales Health puts the cost of... Um, air pollution at $4.7 billion a year. There's lots of research from the United States on health impacts of, of coal dust, and the latest one from the um, Harvard Medical School puts the health cost of, of air pollution from coal in the USA to $187 billion a year. We, we don't, here in Australia, we're not taking that into account when we're talking about sticking coal mines next to people. We definitely should be. Now, now, some miners say, oh, well, if we mine the land, we can, uh, we can restore it. Um, the mob that wants to mine at Felton say they can restore the land to as good, if not better, condition. Well, that seems very hard to believe, uh, particularly when you've got an expert like Clive Bell saying nowhere in the world has it been done before on, land that we, on the type of land that we have here. Now, the government is working on a policy. It's called Strategic Cropping Land Policy. They say they're going to protect some land. And the discussion paper they released in February last year looked pretty encouraging. The language they used was, was great. We thought, well, finally, they're going to do something. They're going to protect um, the best land. And they put out maps to show that at present, only 2.2% of Queensland is used for cropping. Another 1.9% could be used, giving a total of 4.1% of Queensland suitable for cropping. Well, well, common sense would say, well, okay, that's 4.1%. We'll just protect that from mining and causing gas. We'll keep it for food production, and the miners can, can dig around on the other 95.9%. But um, the way things have turned out, the resources industry has bunged on a massive turn, and they say 4.1% is far too much land to be protected. They're putting enormous pressure on the government to get back, cut that area back, and it could be as little as 1% or 1.5% that is, is finally protected. And, and the joke is that the government says that... Um, Coal seam gas operations that are not, uh, 
permanent alienation of the land. So coal seam gas looks like it's not going to be affected. Oh, this is uh, Felton, very productive farming valley. Uh, this company, Amber Energy, want to um, set up a coal to liquid op operation. They want to make petrol out of coal. It's a dirty, stinking process. Huge open cut coal mine and a petrochemical plant. Uh, this plant, according to their figures, would release 4.2 million tons a year of CO2 to be vented into the atmosphere with, with no risk to the community, in their own words. Um, it would use as much water as the whole city of Toowoomba. Uh, the Felton Valley is very productive, not only cropping and horticulture, but there is um, huge um, animal production as well, beef, dairy, pigs, eggs. Our group has done a survey of a 10K radius. And 35% um, of Queensland's eggs are produced at an egg farm within a kilometre of the boundary of where these guys want to build their petrochemical plant. Um, oh, we've also got 6% of Queensland's pork, lettuces, thoroughbred horses. It's a very productive area. Uh, here's Felton's answer to Picasso. This is, <laughs> this is Frank Mengo. We've got a better idea for, for the Felton Valley, and it doesn't involve digging it all up for mining. Um, we employed a consultant to do a study on the renewable energy potential of our valley. And... Um, he came up with um, figures which show we could produce over 700 megawatts just from the Felton Valley. It's only 10 k's by 20 k's roughly, but we've got better sunlight than the south of Spain. And if you've seen what's happening in Spain, they're going berserk building those huge big solar thermal plants. We've got much better radiation than that. And we've also got promising site, sites for wind power. So we can, this is, this is having your cake and eating it as well. We can still produce the food, but we can generate energy at the same time, you know, wind turbines, and, um, and solar panels can coexist happily with agriculture. We could put solar farms on the uh, poor land and uh, wind turbines along the ridges, and um, we wouldn't be wrecking the environment or our farmland. And we'd be creating a lot of new jobs which wouldn't displace existing jobs. Just look, look what's happening in Europe. Germany's up to 17% renewable energy. Last year, they installed over 7,000 megawatts of, of solar PV alone. Spain got 41% of its energy from renewables in March this year. This is from uh, the International Energy Agency website. So this is for Germany. It shows the different um, sources of, of electricity. So the big purple thing along the bottom is coal. And um, yellow is nuclear, but they're... Since uh, Fukushima came along, they're going to phase that out. The, the timeline on here is, um, is 2008, so things have changed a little bit. But uh, look at the, um, the red up the top there, the, uh, the renewables. So that's Germany, switch to Australia. Isn't that embarrassing? I find that very embarrassing that we are in a country with such amazing natural resources, such sunlight, such wind. We're so much at risk from climate change and still we're burning coal and gas. It's crazy. Remember this? This is um, Julia Gillard with um, Stephen Robertson, um, who is now our energy minister. And they were at Cogan Creek, Power Sa Cogan Creek Power Station. It's near Chinchilla. And they were there to unveil a, a solar uh, booster, which is a good thing. It's going to generate 44 megawatts of, of power preheat water before it goes into the coal-fired power station. That's quite ironic, but never mind. Um, and the, the minister has been in Parliament um, boasting about saving 35,000 tonnes a year of CO2. Well, the Felton plant would wipe that out in three days. So um, that's bonkers. Um, we've got a plan already done for converting our country to 100% renewable energy. It's been done by Beyond Zero Emissions. and. Um, if you're not aware of it, I'd recommend you have a look at it. It's a fully costed plan. It shows it can be done. Um, that's our website, and I hope I haven't run over time. You're on, Drew. I'm not talking again. I've just come to be the AV chat. Because they told me I was allowed to this afternoon.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what we're really looking at here is the um, is when and how um, we make a transition from um, coal-based, in fact, fossil fuel-based uh, energy sources to renewable ones. And we've got two choices. We either follow the path of sustainability, where we phase out as quickly and as efficiently as possible and as justly as possible, we phase out coal-fired power station and go straight to renewable energy. Uh, we bypass gas along the way, which is just a distraction. It's a fossil fuel which has got almost as big a carbon footprint as coal and has got a far bigger ecological footprint. Um, so we can go that way or we can do what the fossil fuel industry is planning, which is to be dragged kicking and screaming into the new renewable energy era in 20 or 30 years' time after they have gone for broke on our rural areas and dug up, extracted as much as they can and flogged it off to the rest of the world as fast as they can before an international price on carbon is introduced. And that's what they're doing. That's, that's where governments are heading. Um, the policy right around Australia is to have, um, uh, if we are going to transition out of coal, and they're very reluctant to do that, in Victoria, for example, they can't even get rid of their brown coal, let alone uh, trans transition out of coal-fired. Um, but if they do transition out of it, they're going to go to gas. And uh, all that renewable energy will be is a boutique add-on, like the 44 megawatts at Cogan Creek, uh, or, or maybe uh, powering uh, a remote village somewhere in Western Queensland. So um, what we're looking at in regions like the Darling Downs um, is the most radical transformation of the landscape since the expansion of, of the pastoral frontier in the 19, late 19th century. That's how extensive what we're talking about is. And Rob and I are part of a movement that is trying to change the history of the next 20 years in this country so that we do, in fact, e efficiently, effectively, cleanly and justly transition away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy options. And at the same time, maintain all the landscape values, the food bowl values, um, the biodiversity values um, that exist in rural Australia. We're hampered by the fact that one third of this country, underlying one third of this country is a coal seam of one sort or another. And wherever there's a coal seam, there'll be either coal mining or coal seam gas. Over the Darling Downs, uh, we're likely to have something like 20 probably somewhere between 20 and 30,000 coal seam gas wells. We're, up, we're likely to, we could have up to about 30 open cut coal mines. Some of these coal mines are slated to go onto the best agricultural land in the country, um, as is the coal seam gas. And uh, in fact, some of those coal mines are going to exist in the outer suburbs of some of our cities, like Toowoomba and Bundaberg. We're going to have coal seam gas wells within sight of the Whitsundays. Uh, the, if you go out of this uh, state, you go to places like Sydney, there's coal seam gas wells in the middle of Sydney, in the suburb of uh, St Peter's, no more than a few kilometres from the CBD. There, is no, there are no limits to this industry over the next 20 to 30 years. What they're going to do to this countryside is incredibly radical and incredibly destructive and it's the short term gain. So the question is posed, and um, you know, true to form, Rob has gazumped me because he answered it. Can energy and food production um, coexist? Well, yes, of course they can, as long as they're renewable energy options. But you cannot have this industry, either coal or coal seam gas, coexisting in the uh, form that they have planned uh, for the next 20 or 30 years um, without destroying agriculture. And they do some quite remarkable sums to justify what they're saying. For example, um, I've heard the Queensland Premier, or Queensland State Government Minister, I can't remember which one it was now, probably Stephen Robinson, poor old Stephen. Um, he, um, at one stage he said, um, well, the resources sector is worth $24 billion a year to Queensland. 
and uh, agriculture is worth $22 billion to Queensland a year, so clearly the resources sector should win out. Well, I mean, that is perverted logic because uh, those coal mines and those coal seam gas wells are going to be functioning for 20 years. Agriculture could keep going for thousands. Uh, and that's, that is the, that's the perversity and irresponsibility of what's happening here. Uh, that uh, we're being govern, governed by uh, people whose decision-making um, uh, time frame extends no further than the next elect electoral cycle. Okay, well, what is coal seam gas or um, LNG, liquid natural gas? Um, something happening? Is there a nerd in the audience? <laughs> okay. Um, well, the coal seam, uh, and I'm predominantly talking about coal seam gas. Um, um, Rob's spoken about coal. My, my job is to talk about coal seam gas. There are four companies, uh, basically, in Queensland. Um, they are four big projects that are currently on, on, the, um, on the drawing boards. Three of them already have their approvals. The, um, they are um, QGC, used to be called Queensland Gas Company. Uh, it's now owned by uh, the BG Group, which is, used to be called British Gas. Um, Origin which is uh, part owned by uh, ConocoPhillips, the big US American giant. Um, Arrow Energy, which is owned by Royal Dutch Shell and Total, the French multinational. And Santos, which is owned by PetroChina and Petronas. Uh, Petronas is Malaysian-based mining giant. Um, these projects um, will be pumping uh, coal seam gas out of the Surat uh, and Bowen basins predominantly about 40,000 gas wells, uh, so they say, but it could, in my view, it's likely to go much higher than that. Uh, and 90% um, of it will be for export. They've already signed about $200 billion worth of uh, contracted sales, mostly to China, and the um, investment is worth about $60 billion. If you put it all together, it's probably the biggest single project in Queensland's history. Oh, and if I go back, that map actually is a map of all the mining tenures in Queensland. About between 70 and 80 per cent of Queensland is covered by mining tenure of one sort or another. And in fact, as, as Rob mentioned, some tenures actually overlap each other. You've got coal, coal seam gas, and in some areas you've got bauxite. You know, three of them, one on top of the other. Um, so most of Queensland is a mine site or a potential mine site. And one of, the, one of the nice little um, uh, furfies that go around, you know, and you hear the government say it all the time, look, it's just an expiration permit. It doesn't mean to say it's not going to go ahead. But there has never been a coal mine in this state rejected on environmental grounds. So the only thing that's ever going to stop an open-cut coal mine is if there's not enough coal there or if, the, if it's not uh, economic for them to do it. This is um, what they do with coal seam gas. Um, they drill down into the coal seam, which is an aquifer. Uh, on, the western, on the downs, it's called the Walloon Coal Measures. In order to get the gas, they have to extract water as well. About 350,000 megalitres of water, mostly briny water, is extracted every year. Um, about 20 Sydney harbours at the end of the, the whole operation. Then at the surface, they have to separate that uh, from water and gas, and that gets pumped back the gas gets pumped back to compressor stations, the water gets pumped back to holding ponds, and then they worry about what they're going to do with it. That's another story. Mostly they're probably going to pump it into our inland waterways um, so that our, uh, you know, give it a minimal uh, treatment with reverse osmosis, put it into our, our uh, inland creeks, ends up in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, and turns our inland waterways, which are ephemeral waterways, into permanent ones. That's, the, um, that's an area... Filmed in 2009 between uh, Chinchilla and Tara. Uh, this, is how, this is what it looks like from the air. 
Do you get uh, wells? Where, see the pads that are there? Well, they're wells, gas wells. Seemingly quite innocuous, but in between them there'll be service roads and pipelines. So um, that would have been that would have been forest through there, as you can see around the edges there. That's mostly forest. They would have been cleared. Um, every one of those pads has to be cleared. Every one of those pipelines has to be cleared. Every one of those roads has to be cleared. Tens of thousands of hectares of bush every day, every year, will go down uh, for the um, uh, for this. Now this is 2009. Uh, we took another photograph uh, just a couple of months ago of this same area. I couldn't find the photograph in time to bring it today, but it looks like that. That's actually an area in Montana, uh, in the US, where they, have, they actually have shale gas for the most part in um, Montana, but it looks much the same from the air. A pin cushion. And that's going to be what the Darling Downs and uh, Surratt Basin generally will look like. Um, the, the main impact... Uh, ecological impact will be on the Great Artesian Basin, or at least on underground water. And keep reminding yourself, this is uh, Australia-wide. So I'm talking about Queensland. It, it applies to New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, West Australia, and probably also the Northern Territory. Um, but I'm mostly talking about Queensland. And when you talk about Queensland, you have to talk about the Great Artesian Basin, one of the great natural resource icons of the world. Um, We've been trying, or uh, uh, governments and uh, landowners have been trying to get pressure back into that uh, system because uh, the whole system is based on pressure. And um, um, now we're going to extract something like uh, Sydney Harbour every year from the Great Artesian Basin. That's going to set up a whole new dynamic in that system, so that which is based on pressure. You depressurise one whole level of it and then you, s you start water moving from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, depending on the interconnectivity that exists down there. And, and experts, uh, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is we don't know what level of interconnectivity there is. What's going on out there is an uncontrolled experiment. A friend of mine calls it suck it and see. Um, it's not the precautionary principle, it's the very antithesis of the precautionary principle, it's suck it and see. Let's find out what levels of, of interconnectivity there are. Let's find out what the impacts are, are likely to be as we do it. And what's likely to happen is that aquifers all over the Great Artesian Basin will drop and drop significantly. And um, some of the experts around Australia, independent experts who don't work for gas companies, are saying that um, the Great Artesian Basin will be damaged for centuries. Um, and, I mean, basically, that's, that's, that's the Great Artesian Basin. It, it's, it really is a, a wonderful system. It's made possible the, um, um, into, you know, any sort of development in Western Queensland. Um, an example of aquifers that are likely to be severely affected, one of them is uh, uh, on the Central Downs. It's called the Condamine Alluvium. It's a superficial aquifer that follows the Condamine River. Uh, but it uh, intersects around about the Jim Borb and Callister area uh, with the um, Walloon Coal Measures. At the present time, or up till now, uh, the water has been mostly coming from the Walloon Coal Measures into the um, Condamine Alluvium. Once the um, uh, Walloon Coal Measures gets dewatered, the movement will be the other way. And the irrigation farmers on the central Darling Downs, around Cecil Plains and, and elsewhere, are paranoid. And, and rightly so, that they're going to lose the irrigation water as a result of that, of that. The CSG companies are allowed to take unlimited amounts of water from the Great Artesian Basin. Um, you might have heard of fracking. Fracking, uh, hydraulic fracturing, it's a process of uh, basically setting off underground explosions under the, uh, into the um, coal seam. Um, the and then pumping under enormous pressure, uh, sand, uh, water and chemicals uh, to prise open uh, cracks and you know, build bigger cracks. Because the, the gas is not there in one big bubble. The gas is there in fissures and, and cleats and you know, trapped in there. So the more you can open it up, the better the gas will flow. And sometimes they frack wells up to about seven, six or seven times. Um, now, there's a number of problems with that. The more you frack, the more you're likely to mobilise contaminants that are already down there, and in a coal seam there's plenty of them. Uh, but also, um, so you, you know, you're going to get 
benzene and radioactive materials and all sorts of things coming to the surface out of that. You get chemicals which are left down there into the aquifer uh, from the fracking process. Um, and you heighten the possibility of, of uh, worsening the interconnectivity between aquifers because you're actually you know, expanding those fissures that exist, that, that, that uh, cracks where the water finds its way through. This is Tara. Uh, you might have, uh, Tara uh, community, or at least the resident, rural residential estate outside Tara, very poor people live there um, on small blocks of land. They don't farm, it's their lifestyle blocks. Um, but unfortunately, they happen to be under what's called the Undulla nodes, um, which are the richest gas deposits in Queensland. The um, gas company, QGC, and to a lesser extent Origin, are both desperate to get at it. And to do that, they're going to have to dispossess uh, the people who live there. Um, and let me tell you, if you've got gas on your property, you'll never sell it. Never sell it. So these people are going to live in a gas field. There's about 2,000 of them. They will live in a gas field. They're going to have to live with the, the pollution and so on that goes with that, with the interruption to their lives that goes with, with um, people coming backwards and forwards through a busy gas field. And they're never going to be able to sell their property. And as you can see from that, there are mining tenements all over it. Um, greenhouse gas emissions. The, um, and uh, I hope you know, you, you'll be alert to some of the advertising that's going on by the gas industry. We're, they are clean and green. You know, clean and green, that, that's what they're calling themselves. But it, it really does need uh, some good analysis, uh, this claim. And it's only just, the, the real work is only just starting to be done about it. Uh, even um, uh, President Obama in the United States is talking about, we've got to go clean and green, we've got to go into gas. Um, but there are real problems with that. And especially when fracking is involved, it would seem that the carbon footprint of gas is not much, if at all, better than coal. There is methane escapes in fugitive amounts, um, into fugitive forms from every element of the process. Whether you're talking about the extraction part of it, the pumping part of it, the liquefaction part of it, um, there's, um, there's quite serious um, fugitive emissions occurring. And um, so even if you just take the companies at their word, the, um, the CO2 equivalent that will come from all aspects of the coal seam gas industry in Queensland increases our greenhouse gas emissions in this state by, by 39 million tonnes a year. That's an increase of 21%. We already live in the biggest greenhouse contributing state in, Queen, in Australia, and Australia per capita is the biggest greenhouse emitter in the world. And we're going to, just from this one industry alone, we're going to increase our greenhouse emissions in this state by 21%. And then when you add mining into it, we're going to increase it by about another 11% from that. So it just makes a complete mockery, complete mockery of any claim that we will ever be a responsible member of the world community in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It will be impossible for Australia to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by even 5%, which is what the, the government is aiming at by the year 2020. It will be impossible because of this. Um, landowners. If you're a landowner um, and you get a, uh, a letter in the mail from either a, a CSG or coal company um, saying they want access to your land, Let, let's talk about coal seam gas. Uh, coal's slightly different. If you get a letter from a gas mining company saying they want to negotiate access to your land, um, you, according to the law, according to the um, um, Petroleum and Gas Act 2005, uh, you uh, have 20 days to negotiate a, an access and compensation agreement with the company. If after that 20 days you can't reach an agreement, the, um, the company can uh, demand compulsory mediation. If after another 20, at which you cannot have a lawyer, if after another 20 days uh, you still can't reach agreement, they can take you to the land court. The minute it goes to the land court, they can legally enter your property. 
So you've got 40 days from the time a gas company says they want access to your land to the time they can enter your property. Now, uh, and there's a $50,000 fine for anybody who obstructs. Now, I actually got arrested under that um, section of the Act a few weeks back. Um, and I was actually uh, at the, uh, along with uh, others who were blockading, uh, were at the border of this property. I was there at the landowner's invitation, as were the others. In fact, I, he had nominated me as his agent in this matter. Um, he was in dispute with the company because he said that they had breached the access and compensation agreement that he had with them and therefore he didn't want QGC to come onto his property. I therefore um, you know, uh, decided that I would obstruct and um, QGC then came onto the property, um, called the police in, about 100 police, really with, with horse, horses and dogs and all the rest of it, and, 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 uh, and gun-toting coppers, and, um, um, and arrested me. Uh, and, uh, and I go to court um, with the court case in, in August. But um, it's one, it's a couple of minutes, it's one thing for me to go to court, um, I'm happy to do it, um, but it's another thing, it will be another thing if they tried to do that to ordinary landowners. I am dying for the day that um, a gas company calls the police in to go across a, the border of a farmer's property with his, him and his wife and his kids and his mother-in-law uh, standing at the, at the front gate and they go across the top of them to come into their property and trash it. The minute that happens, we have won. Australians will not accept that. And I don't believe the High Court of Australia will accept it. And that's where we'll take this, ultimately. Um, <laughs> I've got two, um, two minutes, so I'm not going to... Uh, I'll just finish off. Um, what are we demanding? Uh, we want strategic cropping land legislation that covers 4% of this state, as Rob said, not 1%. Uh, not and stopping one mine. There's one mine, I believe, will be stopped by what the Queensland Government is doing, and that's a mine that belongs to a corporation, not a private mining company. They're not going to do it to the big mining company. Um, we want a moratorium on coal seam gas to properly look at its impacts, instead of having a, an uncontrolled experiment occurring out there. Um, banning underground coal gasification, which I haven't talked about, which is nasty, dirty little business. Um, and we want uh, nature refuges protected. At the current time, we've got about 160 of them in the state. None of them are protected from mining, and about 40 of them have got mines planned for them. Um, we want settled areas protected. Um, you know, it's ridiculous to think that the outer suburbs of Toowoomba, for example, will be mined for coal. Uh, and what we've seen seeing developed is a Green Farmer Alliance in all of this, and it's about time. Late last year, a number of us, so the guy standing at the back there in the green shirt is, uh, is Rob, um, the, the, uh, uh, the grey-haired fellow in the middle is me, um, and the rest of them are representatives of different action groups across, the, um, across southern Queensland. We came together to announce the Lock the Gate campaign. I originally suggested it be called Shut the Gate, but the guy on the end there in the hat said, um, well, no, everybody in the country shuts the gate. Uh, so, what we've got to do is lock the gate. So, it's the lock the gate campaign and um, in places like Kingaroy, uh, Felton, Gowrie, just outside Toowoomba, uh, the Scenic Rim, uh, the Bimblebox Nature Refuge um, and, and others that I just couldn't think of before I came here today have all decided to lock the gate. They will not negotiate with companies. They won't negotiate with them. The minute you enter the whole EIS process um, in, in this state, you've lost. Because EISs will not stop mining. Simple as that. It's a corrupt process, completely corrupt. It's only about what conditions the development goes ahead. It's not about whether it goes ahead or not. Um, and it, across the country, people are locking the gate as well. In the Pilliga Scrub, uh, on border ranges, even in Sydney itself, uh, in the Illawarra uh, and northern rivers, they are all locking their gates, refusing landowners, refusing to negotiate with mining companies and city-based 
um, uh, supporters and environmental campaigners like myself around the country are joining them. Uh, this will be the biggest social movement in Australia's history and it has to win if we're going to go down the path of sustainability. Thanks everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for some questions. This is Queensland and you're being filmed. So before you ask your question, would you wait till our, our person arrives with the microphone? We might take this gentleman here in the middle who was, had his hand up like a rocket. <laughs> Could you please keep your questions uh, as brief as possible? Thank you. It occurs to me one question we haven't addressed. Um, most of us drive cars. Um, Australia's conventional oil and gas supplies are rapidly depleting and almost exhausted. Um, increasingly, Australia imports uh, fuel oil to, to put in our cars and our freight vehicles. We have to pay for that oil in US dollars. Therefore, we have to export. And most of the coal we dig up in the coal seam gas is exported to earn the US dollars uh, to buy the fuel to put in our cars. So how do we, how do we address the balance of trade issue where we um, actually have sustainable imports and exports? <laughs> Can I have a go at that one? Um, well, we need to transform our economy. We need to move away from importing fuel. We need to move to uh, electricity generation, electric cars, public transport, um, you know, the mob that wants to um, make petrol out of coal at, at Felton um, trot out this um, business that, um, you know, we're importing all this fuel and it's costing us a lot of money. Well, if you, if you move from um, refining crude oil to make petrol to making petrol out of coal, it's like um, someone with a, a smoking problem and failing health running out of cigarettes and taking up cigars. It's, it's just completely nutty. Um, so we've got to change. There was someone in the third row, fourth row back. Yes, um, I was at uh, the presentation uh, yesterday morning uh, where we had uh, various people on the panel, including the uh, Minister for Resources and Environment, and in response to a question we put in regard to the toxic chemicals and so on that are going down into the aquifer and so on, we got a, uh, what I'd say is a, certainly a less than satisfactory answer to the effect that you're saying, oh, you know, here in Queensland we're not using any of those chemicals that you saw in that documentary Gasland and, and uh, it's all being contained, blah, blah, blah. So um, where can we get access to uh, good information to counter this sort of misinformation? And um, I'm sure uh, what she said in regard to the known chemicals being used is not correct from what I understand. Could you please... Um, I can give you a... Um uh, a ready site to go to, um, but, but just quickly to an answer, um, um, she's correct only to the point that the BTEX chemicals have been banned from fracking fluids in Queensland. BTEX are uh, uh, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene and um, xylene. Um, they're hydrocarbons, volatile organic uh, compounds, and um, highly toxic and, and uh, uh, carcinogenic, uh, but there are plenty of other chemicals in those fracking fluids, plenty of other chemicals, uh, all of which, you know, many of which are <coughs> mentioned in Gasland. And, um, um, and as Marion Lloyd-Smith, who's worthwhile Googling, Marion Lloyd-Smith, uh, who uh, runs the National Toxics Network and is on the chemical regulatory body, Knickknacks, I love that name, um, they... Um, um, she says 21 out of, the, out of 23 flacking, fracking fluids that they are aware of um, haven't even been properly assessed in Australia. So uh, we are actually using, you know, a, a farmer could not do that. A farmer could not use chemicals that hadn't been properly assessed. These companies are able to do that. And they're able to put it into our underground water systems. Um, if you go to the Gasland website, um, can't remember it offhand, but if you Google Gasland, you'll get there. Um, then um, you'll find many of the chemicals that are in these fracking fluids. Main fracking companies are 
the two main fracking companies in, um, in Queensland are Halliburton uh, and um, Schlumberger. There was a question here, and then we'll take the gentleman up there. So this one, gentleman here first. Someone there? You, he's, you happy? Okay, so um, up, oh no, here we go, yes. Thanks for the presentation. A um, question for both Rob and Andrew. Uh, do you support a carbon tax? <laughs> and in view of what all this implies, what price would you put on carbon and why? Is that to me or to Rob? Each to me. Please. Yeah. Um, I'll go first if you like. Um, I think um, the, all this debate we've got politically about the carbon tax is, is just an illustration of how, how sad it is that... Um, the way things have gone with the debate in this country, you know, the, the science is absolutely clear. Um, you know, look what's happened in Britain. All sides of politics are are, um, are, are committed to reducing carbon emissions quickly. There was a, an announcement just last week on uh, huge reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from Britain. So, um, sure, we've got to do something. I don't want to get tied down to do I support the carbon tax or not. I mean, we've got to do something. Um, I would support it, yes, but... Um, Let's not get too hung up on little details like that because there's going to be much bigger issues to deal with uh, very soon. Um, I, um, um, I also support a carbon tax, but it's, it's not enough. And the problem about just having a carbon tax is if it's likely to be in the level that we're looking at, which is somewhere between $25 and $40 a tonne, um, all that will do is give us gas, so to speak. Um, and... Um, um, it will make gas more com uh, competitive as against coal. So, um, but it's not enough for renewables to kick in. So uh, we have to have a package that combines, you know, I don't mind a reasonably small carbon tax, as long as on top of that there are other measures that will actually um, uh, encourage the adoption of renewables, like a national feed-in tariff, like increasing the renewable energy target. Um, uh, a couple of my cocky mates are um, suggesting, for example, uh, uh, things like a, um, um, an export um, tax on coal. I think it's a great idea. Um, but, you know, th those sorts of measures are uh, needed in order, both disincentive and incentive measures, are needed to just simply go beyond what a carbon tax will give us, which is gas. There was a woman up the, up the back. Are you, are you still interested? No? The, okay. Yeah, the gentleman there. In, in. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is for Drew. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of where you think the system itself is failing and, and might possibly be broken because I've, I, I watched Gasland, I saw the Four Corners uh, documentary and uh, all about coal seam gas and it seems to me like the science is really clear but um, science seems to be taking a, a back seat massively in terms of government policy and legislation and I, I've written to my local member, I've written to my federal member, I've written to everybody who I thought might be remotely interested in this and I've been given back pretty much just uh, pro-industry propaganda and it, it really leads me to a point of apathy and it's great to hear that you're talking about things possibly going to the high court but is that the only hope we have left? Like where is the system, like do I write to Anna Bly? I didn't really get a reply from her but what, who, who, why is this happening? Like, okay. Can I just ask you not to write to Anna Bly? Uh, in fact, don't write to any government minister. Don't write to any department. It's a waste of time. Um, for God's sake, give me some money, you know, um, <laughs> or, or come to a rally, or write to the papers, or, um, uh, you know, get involved in the movement. Because there's only, what's happening here is completely political. The, um, both, both major parties are completely in thrall to the mining industry, and especially coal and coal seam gas. And um, they're committed, and, and their arguments are just standard. Um, uh, it'll create jobs, number one. Uh, it'll create 20,000 jobs in Queensland, 16,000 of them, I might add, 16 to 17,000 in the construction phase, then they disappear. So it's not that, not that wonderful. But when you're only talking about the next election, makes sense. Um, They'll, they'll get royalties out of it, you know, for the next 20 years. And given that they're t talking three-year cycles, that makes sense too. So they, they have every reason to support this industry 
looking at it from a purely narrow political perspective that doesn't take into account the long term. Whenever you get that in history, um, the only thing that can, can uh, act against it is a social movement strategy. Because th this, sort of, um, this, this sort of practice is not only uh, enmeshed in the political structure, it's enmeshed in the social psyche. And so that most people, if you ask them about the mining industry, they might have sort of resentments against it one way or another or caution about it. They say, oh, we need it for our prosperity. And, um, uh, and that seems to excuse anything. So just like in the southern states of the US, uh, racism or you know, um, the environment movement generally in the 60s and 70s, um, when there was a need to sort of re-educate the public, mobilise the public, uh, and then put pressure on the decision makers, it's a social movement strategy that you need. And that's why I said, don't bother with going to governments. They're, they're, they're bought and paid for. Pa support the social movement which is growing in this country, which will mobilise hundreds of thousands of people, which then puts pressure, uh, and, and, and which does things like go to the courts, you know, take, take um, matters to the court puts pressure on the local level, puts pressure on the decision makers, um, goes into direct action, you know, slows them down, harass them, um, wreck their business plans. You know, I, I'm, in, you know, I'm in favour of all of those sorts of, of measures which slows down this industry enough for people to get to realise what's going on and get it under control again. It is only the people of this country who are going to turn this around, not governments. I think there's a gentleman in the front and then we have time <laughs> for maybe one more right up the back, but then I'm really terribly sorry, everyone, but I'm under orders to throw you out. I'd like to ask both of you whether you were present to uh, the questionnaire uh, yesterday opening in the, uh, the main hall there, down below. I think it's called The Edge there, but whatever it's called, uh, in which the Premier and uh, the Minister for the Environment uh, were on the panel, and I think one person from the Greens Party to answer the question. This is a questionnaire Q&A, which is broadcast, I believe, and I'm not sure whether it's on the ABC, which station they put it on. So I'd like to just ask that question, then I'll make a comment. Were either of you, were, did you attend that? Well, I can tell you that at that meeting, um, I think the last question statement was made by me, uh, in which I focused solely on the need for there to be a land use laws. In other words, you've got to look at uh, the, the zoning of all land in Queensland, I put that proposition to them, uh, and that they look at the best use of land. Now, it's indisputable that agriculture is the case in many of the instances. So this forced the uh, Premier uh, and that to, to make a comment that they actually were, were going to strengthen and even where the mining companies have always had this unlimited access, uh, it's had the top priority in history, uh, to access, uh, to, to explore for, 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 for minerals. And, and th they want to change that. Well, that's obviously one of the points I'm making. But the, if you get a proper land use plan and it's zoned right across the state of Queensland, I made that point, so that it'd be a role model for Australia. And here's the point. So is that the best needs, the best uses are zoned and it's always with the paramounts of the human interest first. So that's covering your point. And it also takes in the animals and it takes the, the land itself, forest, trees and so forth. In other words, the environment. And this is what's not being done. And at the present moment, I'll finish right now. Thank you. But one of the dangers is, as you've just discovered, that a person gets a fee simple owns the land, you, you are denied the royalties. In other words, the miners uh, are able to say, well, look, uh, people have got uh, 
uh, fruit fee simple to this land here, and if I buy that from them, I can get all those benefits. And, and that's where they're knocking you out. And so this so is why you've got to can, finish. Can you finish, this please? Is finish. This is the finish. Uh, so if you could get a copy of that film, uh, and certainly watch the program, I think you'll find you can use it, and you might be able to use it in the courts to your advantage. Thank you for your comment. I wonder, could we go to one last question at the back? Um, I was just wondering with some of these projects, is it possible to actually make them economically unviable just through non-compliance? If you hold them up long enough, will it just cost... Through what, sorry? Just, um, just not cooperating? Can you hold oh, them up yeah. long enough that it will just cost them too much money if you get enough people involved? Is that actually possible or are they just too rich? <laughs> well, we've got to try everything. No, no, it's possible. Uh, it, I, I, I'm more optimistic than he is. The, um, um, in fact, it's the pointy end of the campaign, is non-cooperation. This, this is a Gandhian campaign. Uh, it's, it's saying um, we will not cooperate uh, with the process. It's a bad law. It's a very bad law. Um, and um, uh, people are just, by locking their gates, um, are not just simply uh, saying we won't cooperate with the process, but they're setting in train a, a set of legal steps that will end in the High Court. And it will do what you're talking about, which is to challenge the whole right of a secondary tenement holder, a mining company, to come in over the top of a primary um, uh, land tenure holder, which is the, uh, which is the landowner. I believe that's, that's what will uh, ultimately uh, test out just whether this industry goes ahead or not. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I am sorry to have to bring it to a close, but um, as I say, I am under orders. Um, can I ask you to join with me in thanking Drew Hutton and Rob McCreech?